Or as a friend of mine said one time in church, sit down. Kind of informal. Well, good morning, church. So good to see you. And more coming back and trickling in all the time as we gather on Sunday mornings. Um, good morning to everybody on Facebook and YouTube and, and well, good whatever it is for you after a new morning or, or whatever. Have you read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11? Anybody read that in preparation for today or ever read it in the past? You know, you don't have to put your hand up, but if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 11, then you might understand why I was thinking about calling in sick today. <laughs> this is not an easy chapter. But even as the Apostle Peter said about some of Paul's writings, that they are difficult to understand, we can sympathize with Peter and say, this is one of those chapters where it's hard to understand Paul. Figuring out what chapter 11 is really all about is difficult. But the reward is worth all the effort. Just like trying to figure out what life is all about can be extremely difficult. But the reward is worth all the effort. And if you try to figure out what life is all about without any reference to God or any appeal to God, then you look just like a dog chasing its tail. You know, you'll just go through your whole life going around in circles. It will also help a great deal if we approach the Bible with openness and expectation. The Bible says God rewards those who earnestly seek him. So there is this payoff if we make the effort. If we come to God for help and we come with faith and expectation and anticipation, there's a reward for that. There's a payoff. Now, when you come up against things in the Bible that are hard, I think what really bothers is not so much that I just don't understand what this is about. I think what really bothers us is the fact that we don't understand the wisdom behind it. We don't understand the reason why God is saying this in the Bible. And if we can just grasp a little bit of the wisdom behind it, then I think we begin to grasp the bigger vision of God not only through history, but in our own personal lives. So we come to this chapter today. I think it's also helpful for us to remember, what did Paul think about these Corinthian Christians? What did he think about this church? How did he view them? And in the second letter, the next letter over, in chapter 7, he calls them my beloved people. You don't call somebody beloved unless you love them. I mean, he really loves this church. And he says to this church in 2 Corinthians, I speak to you freely and openly. In other words, he can talk about anything. He feels so comfortable with these people that he can say anything on his heart. He can speak to them freely and openly. And then he says, I regularly boast about you. I mean, isn't that great? How's your church? How's that church in Corinth? Man, they are awesome people. They are great people. You know, I, I regularly boast about you. He loves them. Now, we're going to look at the first couple of verses in the chapter. And the way he begins this chapter is, uh, is kind of like leadership 101, parenting 101, um, uh, Coaching 101, Teaching 101, Friendship 101, Marriage 101, because it is just Life 101. And what I mean is that if you are in any kind of a relationship, friendship, marriage, work, you know, whatever the relationship is, if you have something to say to somebody that's a little bit uncomfortable, if you, if you have something to say to somebody that you want to give a little nudge in a different direction, what does Leadership 101 say, Life 101? Say something positive before you say the other. Before you say one thing, say something nice. Say something positive, and then you can use that word, but. <laughs> so let's look at chapter 11, which really begins in verse 2. He says, I'm jealous over you. 
and it's God's own jealousy. I arranged to marry you off, wait a minute. Where, I was just testing to see if you were. I, I would like to do 2 Corinthians next, and that was 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're making good progress. <laughs> Just turn around, Gary. It's all right. Oh, well, you've already read it. Forget it. But, but I'm reading from this really cool translation. Okay. Verse 2. I congratulate you that you are remembering me in everything. And you are keeping the traditions as I handed them down to you. But... <laughs> I want you to know this, that the Messiah is the head of every man, and the husband is the head of every wife, and God is the head of the Messiah. See, he begins with this lovely little phrase, I commend you, I congratulate you, because, and he, I think what he's saying is, because you want to know what I think about this problem you're having that you have actually included me in an understanding of working this out. And then he says, I'm thrilled that you are keeping the traditions. Now, that's a really important piece in this chapter because I think he's referring that they have this quality about them where they want to keep the main thing the main thing. Whatever it is that makes the church the church, they want it. And we'll see a little bit later that means holding on to what the church is really all about so that it doesn't appear in society as just another social club or clique or religion. But after saying congratulations or I commend you, then comes this famous word. But, but. And when he makes this contrast between the praise, but this, what follows after that, after verse 3, is going to be all about the problem. And here we walk into a biblical minefield. And all through the Christian ages, that's 2,000 years, Christians have not been able to agree on what this chapter is really about, these verses. So let's just admit that. If 2,000 years of church history, and they still don't know, we're probably not going to walk out of here going, we're all in agreement. But I want to suggest a way of looking at these verses this morning that you can make some sense of the wisdom behind them. That you can bring some kind of a light to shine upon them so that you understand not only what's happening in Corinth, but you can say, well, how does that work out in our life, in our church, in our society? When I became a Christian at the age of 22, it wasn't very long before I became aware of all the different denominations and choices. And I knew about denominations, you know, before that. I just never gave them any thought. It just wasn't a concern of my life. But now suddenly it was a big concern in my life. Where do I belong? Where do I fit? And as I looked at all the different denominations, I saw that there were a lot of people in those churches who were extremely loyal to some biblical insight that some founder had. Luther says, and Calvin says, and we Baptists think, and, and we Nazarenes say this, and you know, it goes on and on and on. So then I began to look more deeply at all the different possibilities. And I, in the Christian churches, I came across something that I liked. Even though, now listen very carefully to what I say right now. I love what they say, even though they don't always put it in practice very well. That in reality, they're no different than any other churches, they're no different than any other denominations. That's the reality of it. But they were holding on to something that I went, oh. The one thing that caught me to begin with was their motto. In faith, unity, and opinions, freedom, and all things love. We weren't the first to say that. That comes back to Augustine in you know, the 380s. Uh, but they were using it. They, they said, that's important. And over the years, I just said, well, to myself, 
we just seem to always say, define faith and put this in this box and faith is this and faith means that. And, and I said, you know, it's really about who you put your faith in, Jesus. And so I, I just, I say myself, in Christ unity, in opinions, liberty or freedom, and in all things, love. What that means is if someone came to a Christian church and said, well, what's your position on the Holy Spirit or women in leadership or speaking in tongues or homosexuality or climate change in the earth or whatever? The answer in the Christian church has historically been, we don't have one. We don't have a position on that. Why? Because our unity and our essence as a church is not in our positions, but in our Lord. That's a huge difference. Our unity is not in the position we take, but the position we are in. We're in Christ. Our position, you would say, or might say, is that Jesus is the Lord of all life and he is the Lord of all creation and he is the final word of God. Hebrews chapter 1. And his word is final. Hebrews chapter 4. John chapter 1. That's our position. Jesus is Lord. He's at the top. He's the head of the body. His word is absolute truth and absolute final. But on this journey of life, with all of the conflicting powers around us and all the pressures that are applied to us, we don't all have the same knowledge at the same time, and we don't all reach the same conclusions at the same time. So I don't expect today that we're going to walk out of here and we're all going to have the same understanding of chapter 11. I don't expect that. But I do expect that we will walk out of here agreeing that what Paul says about Jesus and what Paul says about the church really matters. And that we have a mission in this world and we have a reason for being the church in this world in time and place. And that the real issue of this chapter will not just simply change your mind about some few things, that the real thing behind this chapter will change your life. I think that's possible here today. Now before we begin to slice and dice these verses, we should remember one more thing. Try to use the, the big, plain, clear verses of the Bible to shed light on the problem passages of the Bible. In other words, if, if there's a real hard saying of Jesus or a problem passage you come up against, try to, try to get that really large, clear scripture that speaks to everything and put the other one underneath that one for light. So if we're gonna do that with this chapter, here's what we do. We go back to Peter's first sermon in the book of Acts, very first sermon ever preached, and he uses an Old Testament text from Joel as the text for his sermon that day, Joel chapter 2. And in that text and in his sermon, he says, in these last days, that's the days we're living in, the age of the church, he says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. All flesh. Yes. Not just Jews. Not one particular nation, not just on Egypt, not, you know, what, and all flesh, all races, all tribes, all nations, all languages, all humans. And what does he say next? And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Now, yeah, there were prophets and there were, you know, different kinds of judges and leaders in the Old Testament. But what Joel is saying, what Peter is saying is now fulfilled, that this prophecy is fulfilled, is that your sons and daughters, men and women together, will be prophesied. That's new. 
Later on, we see in the book of Acts that the evangelist Philip had a wife and two daughters, and his two daughters prophesied. In a couple of chapters from now, we're going to be in 14, and Paul in 14, 3 says, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding, their encouragement, and consolation. That's probably not what we think of New Testament prophesying to be about, but that's what it is in Paul's mind. A prophet is somebody who speaks to people. It doesn't say women just speaking to women, men just speaking to men. It says a prophet speaks to people for their upbuilding, their encouragement, and their consolation. That is basically what we call preaching today. That's basically preaching. And what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 11 and through the whole book of 1 Corinthians is he wants to see this church continue to grow and be holy, which is defined healthy. He wants it to be a healthy, loving, functioning church. And he wants to see men and women serving God as God has called them. So if he called you as a man, be a man. If he called you as a woman, be a woman. And serve God where you are. But in Corinth, they're having a problem. I wish I knew exactly how the problem was presented or described to Paul. That would help so much. Here come these people from Corinth. They go all the way around, you know, either they sailed across the Aegean Sea or they went all around by land. So it took them days and days and days. And they find Paul in Ephesus and they want to give a report what's going on back there in Corinth. But along the way, they say something about this one particular problem. And they describe it to him. Maybe they use names of people. And Paul has all this knowledge about that church. He's, he spent 18 months there. He knows these people. He knows the church. He listens to the problem. And we don't have any of that. We just do not have that side of the conversation. So we look at the chapter. And we can divide it into two parts. And in the back of our mind is this whole bunch of stuff we don't know. And it has these two parts. It goes from verses 2 to 16 is one part dealing with these head coverings and all of that and then 17 through 34 which deals with the Lord's Supper and I want to show you today how those are linked together so let's look at verse 3 through 16 I'm in 1 Corinthians I'm in chapter 11 just checking good pages haven't flipped you know, I flip out once in a while, the pages are the same. He says in verse 3, I want you to know this, that the Messiah is the head of every man, and the husband is the head of every wife, and God is the head of the Messiah. Every man who prays or prophesies while wearing something on his head brings shame on his head, and every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered brings shame on her head. It would be just the same if she had her head shaved, like she wanted to look like a prostitute. For if a woman isn't covered, then she should be shaved. But if it's shameful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then let her be covered. A man ought not to cover his head, you see. He is the image and glory of God. But a wife is the glory of her husband. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. And man was not created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. That's why the wife must have authority on her head, because of the angels. However, woman is not apart from man, nor man apart from woman. In the Lord, for, there, for just as the woman came from man, so now man comes into the world by means of a woman, and everything is from God. Judge the matter for yourselves. Is it really appropriate for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does the nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is shameful to him? But if a woman has long hair, it's her glory. Her hair is given her, you see, instead of a covering or as her covering. So we're not talking about hats and veils and stuff. We're talking about long hair or short hair. And her hair, as long, is her glory. 
If anyone wants to dispute this, we have no other custom, nor do the churches of God. Now, this talk about heads does not come out of the book of Genesis. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, we are just told very plainly, very clearly, that God created mankind, male and female, together, equally. They're created. In chapter 2, we have this expanded story of creation where the woman is taken from the man's side. And it's just, it's, in Hebrew, it's more like a, a mass of cells, his molecular structure. And he takes this portion of his side, enough molecules and atoms and everything to make him DNA and all that, and makes the woman. And it's always been taught, it's always been important, that God did not take, uh, take her from higher up or lower down, but from his side, so they are equal. Rabbis have taught that for thousands of years. They are equal. But when you come to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, there's this headship talk that doesn't appear in, in, in the Genesis account. This is, this is unique to Paul. So what is he doing? What is he doing with this little bit of original teaching? And I'm, what I'm going to try to do now is give you some of the wisdom behind this stuff. So that as you look at the complex verses themselves, if you can see some of the wisdom behind it, maybe that helps. And I think he's doing this to help them connect the first creation to this new creation. Because I think the big problem here, as we've seen in Corinth, is that Paul goes along teaching this fantastic truth that in Jesus Christ, the new creation has already begun. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the first fruits of this new creation. And that's what Christianity is all about, that we live in this new creation. But you get to a church like Corinth where they're all excited about their freedom, they're all excited about this new faith, and they say, how do we apply this? How in our services do we show the difference that we're not just another religion and we're not just a clique in society? How do we do this when we can fully see and we're fully aware of the differences between the sexes, male and female? And Paul introduces this idea of headship. And, and head has three different meanings. We do it in English just like they did in Greek. It can be your physical head that you sometimes lose if it's not connected. It's your head. Head can mean the sum total of something. The sum total. Well, the battle came to a head when? Boom. You know, One general made a big mistake. The battle came to a head. You know, the, the argument came to a head when? And then head is used as the source of something. The headwaters of the Columbia are up in Canada. That's the head of the river. And Paul is using the word head as a source, and he's using head in a literal sense, the head, the thing on top of your neck. Now, listen very carefully. If you look at exactly to whom he is speaking, I mean, you know, just kind of just set everything else you've ever heard about it aside for a minute and just say, what does Paul actually say and to whom is he saying? And if you look at it, precisely at to whom he's speaking, then you suddenly see to whom he's not speaking. And there's some people in the church that he's not addressing. He's not saying anything to them. If you can imagine the congregation in a house and everybody's gathered together, they're standing around talking. Now, from what we've already read in 1 Corinthians, we already know that there are young, unmarried women in the church, never been married. It's already said that. And we know that there are some, maybe a little bit older, who are young and widowed. And we know that there are others who are older and widowed, which means there's some, uh, not only widows, but widowers, I mean, some guys who are running the same situation. So there's single people and there's formerly married people. There's divorced people in the church. 
So if you've got these groups of people standing around, here are the young uh, widow, or the young unmarried, and they're talking about someday being married. And on this side over here, you've got all the young unmarried guys who are looking at them thinking, which one? You know? And that's, a, that's supposed to be a little funnier than it came out. <laughs> then you've got the unmarried widows who are talking about survival. How are we going to make it without a husband? It's all the pressures there. They're processing all that stuff. And then you've got the older widows, you know, who are chatting about whatever they chat about and their concerns for, for livelihood and for health and, and all those issues. And you've got the men doing the same thing. you get all these groups talking. There is one group in the church who are married and they're together. And they tend to hang out together and talk together. they got common stuff together. Guess who Paul is talking to? Them. So he doesn't mention these other people. When he's talking about this problem, he's not talking to all these other people. And here's, here's the thing, that, that as I processed this, I went, ah, maybe. So I offer it to you. The word wife in Greek is exactly the same word for woman. We have two words, they only had one. So you kind of had to know by context whether it's wife or woman. And in this situation, I think he is always using wife. Even though generally speaking, you might say woman in the context of what he's saying, I think he's narrowed it down to specific people. And I think it should be wife all the way through. And if that's the case, then there are a few married couples who in trying to figure out how do, we, how do we do this new creation thing where there is no male and female anymore in Christ. Galatians, Colossians, you know, he says that in a number of places. So Paul has said that, how do we apply that teaching in church? How do we do this? And they have come up with a way of doing that is missing everything up. There's a group of married people, maybe only one married couple, maybe five, who knows? who are just messing everything up because they've gone to the wrong conclusion about it. But apparently some of the wives are cutting their hair off and trying to look less female. And some of the men are growing their hair out and trying to look less male, as though now everybody will see in Christ there's neither male nor female. Aren't we just clever? And all they're doing is confusing everybody. They're sending the wrong message. And what Paul does in these verses is remind them of their interdependence in creation. That's the really special big thing that Paul says here. When it comes right down to what he says, the bottom line in the Lord is we can't live without each other, male and female. Maybe the woman came into the world because Adam was created first, but there isn't a man around here who didn't get into this world without the help of a woman. And we are interdependent. And I think that's the one amazing thing that Paul offers to them and says, this will bridge that problem you have between first creation and new creation and how we should look in church. And what we should be doing is not cutting our hair or growing it out, trying to look less human, or human less male or less female. We should be accepting what God designed us to be in our mother's wombs, male or female, but we should be living in this interdependent way because in his world and much in our world, nobody saw that. That would be revolutionary. I mean, the, the woman was just considered, you know, just somebody to have the kids, make them legal. You know, women were for pleasure. And Paul is saying, no, you're interdependent. Wow. I think that's the bridge. Now, he does say the wife is to have a sign of authority on her head. But what is interesting is, he doesn't say the wife is to have a sign of authority on her head because of her husband. Doesn't say that. And he doesn't say the wife... What I have to talk about now isn't a matter for praise. 
He doesn't even start with a praise. He just starts right in with the but. When you meet together, you make things worse, not better. What I mean is this, to begin with, I hear that when you come together in the assembly, the church, there are divisions among you. Well, I believe it, at least partly. There are bound to be groupings among you, those married and unmarried and all that stuff. That's how genuine one among you will stand out, I suppose. And that's sarcastic, I think. So when you gather together into one meeting, that's the church, into one meeting, it isn't, notice that, is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. It's supposed to be, but it wasn't. Everyone brings their own food to eat. One person goes hungry while another gets drunk. Haven't you got houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise God's assembly and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? No, in this matter I won't. This, you see, is what I received from the Lord and handed on to you. On the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body. It's for you. Do this as a memorial of me. He did the same with the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new relationship in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this as a memorial of me. For whenever you eat this bread or drink the cup, you're proclaiming or announcing or preaching the Lord's death until he comes. It follows from this that anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone, everyone should test themselves. That's how you should eat the bread and drink the cup. You see, if you eat and drink without discerning or recognizing the body, you eat and drink judgment on yourself. That's why several of you are weak and sick and some have either fell asleep or died. But if we learn how to judge ourselves, we would not incur judgment. But when we are judged by the Lord, we're punished so that we won't be condemned along with the world. So my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, treat one another as honored guests by waiting for each other. If anyone is hungry, they should eat at home so that you don't come together to find yourselves facing judgment. I will put other matters in order when I come. In the ancient world, if you're having a dinner party, Anybody walking by your house and seeing the party going on is welcome to come in. Whether it's, whether it's you know, Judea where Jesus lived, or whether it's Paul in the Roman Empire, same, same kind of principle of culture applied. So that person may not be invited to the meal, so they won't be eating, but they are free to come in and hang out and observe and listen, and kind of curiously, what's going on? See, that is why that sinful woman could walk into the Pharisee's house where Jesus is dining at the table, reclining, which, I mean, remember, they, they lay on their side and they eat like this with their feet out in Jesus' day, not Rembrandt's Last Supper thing, you know, or Da Vinci on their side. And she comes into the house, and you've got to think, that just must drive that Pharisee crazy. You know? I mean, here's this sinful woman and he, she, but she is free to come into the Pharisee's very own house. And there's nothing he can do about that in culture. And she sits at the feet of Jesus and she cries. So much so that his feet are wet and the dust is washing off. And then she lets down her hair of all things inside of a stranger's house. Pharisee to boot. And she uses her long hair and she dries his feet. She was doing what culture allowed her to do. And so if you were in Corinth and you were having a home meal was the church gathered, house churches, anybody in Corinth could walk by and drop in out of sheer curiosity. I mean, word on the street is, these people gather every Sunday evening and call themselves some kind of a family. What would make them a family? That's a big family. Drop in, you're curious. What's this new life they keep talking about? I hear that they're talking about some kind of new life. What's a new life? Drop in. Curious. And what are they doing when they have that meal 
and they stop and they see they're eating somebody's body and drinking somebody's blood. Are they cannibals? Curiosity. Drop in and see firsthand. So here they are meeting on Sunday evenings in someone's home and they're having a common meal. And at some point during the meal, later on in church history, they called it agape feast. It was a real supper, a real spread, a real potluck. But at some point in the middle of it, they would stop and one of the members of the church would be designated to be the presider. In the early church, there's a lot of evidence for this, that different members of the church presided at the table. We get our word president from that, someone who presides at the table. And that presider, whether it's a man or a woman, would take the bread, and they didn't always use unleavened bread because they weren't Jewish, this is primarily a Gentile church. And they would take a, a, either a loaf of bread or some of the bread they, at their meal, and they would break it, and they would give the words, this is my body. And they would take a cup and either juice or wine. Their, their wine was, was uh, two parts water, one part wine. So the whole family, kids and everybody could drink it. Uh, so they would take their wine, and they would pour it into the cup, and everybody would have the cup, the Lord's Supper. Not a Passover meal. That's a Jewish meal, you know, dealing with all of their past history. This meal was called the Lord's Supper, or communion, or Eucharist. Eucharist means Thanksgiving in Greek. And they gathered in worship around the Lord's table. And when they did that, Paul is saying this is absolutely central to defining them as Christians. And when they did this, they were manifesting to the watching world, the curious world, what this new life in Christ looks like. And they were demonstrating this until Jesus returns. And in their case, their very actions were destroying the impact of their witness, absolutely destroying it. And so he says, it wasn't even the Lord's Supper you took. Doesn't qualify. You see, if you were among the free and the wealthy, Sunday afternoon, you can just start thinking, hey, you know, I'm free, I'm wealthy. You know? So I've got servants to make the food. I can use the, I can bring the best of foods. I can bring the best of wines and our family can go. We don't even have to carry it there. And we come to the place of the meeting and we start spreading the food out and we're waiting. And we're waiting. And we have to wait until the sun goes down when all of the hired people or slaves get off work and they cannot leave before sundown. And they don't have a lot. You know, they don't have a lot of resources, nobody to carry it for them. So they bring the meager food that they can bring. Maybe some, sometimes they don't bring anything. And they come to this meal. And when they get there, the people who have a lot have been eating a little bit of this, eating a little bit of that, eating this, drinking the wine, and some of them are passed out. They're just tired, sunshine, warm, boom, they're gone. They weren't waiting for the others. They just began drinking and eating and falling asleep. And Paul chastises them and says, haven't you got homes to just eat and drink in? This meal is more than a meal. It is the assembly of the church. It is an illustration of what is to come. And it is done in anticipation of the great marriage supper of the Lamb. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, people will come from the east and from the west, from the north and the south. They will come from every tribe and every language and every nation in the world. And they will all be together at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the Lord's Supper looks forward to that, anticipates that. It announces that Jesus is making that possible. In verse 29, he says, if you eat and drink without recognizing the body, you eat and drink judgment on yourself. Well, the body to be recognized is, number one, the body of Christ raised from the dead. He's alive. So he is the host, and he is the one who offers the invitation. Every Sunday, he's saying, I've got my table spread. I'm inviting you to come and have a meal with me. Every Sunday. That's pretty powerful invitation. And the body is also the bread. This is my body broken for you. And the body is also to be recognized is the church. Those who are gathered. 
And discerning the body, recognizing the body, means taking into account not only who's here and what their needs are, but those who are not here and why they're not here. That's discerning the body. The body of Jesus alive, the body of the bread, and the body of the people of Christ. And if we don't discern the body, we're drinking judgment upon ourselves. If we think, this is just between me and God. No, it's not. Not at all. This is between all of us and God. Together, interdependent, can't get here without each other, can't exist without each other. We need each other. Look at, look at verses 23 through 25 again. He says, this you see is what I received from the Lord and handed on to you. On the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks. Look, you know, you ever stop and just read that? On the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed, wouldn't that be one of the most painful things of your life to have someone close to you betray you? What did he do? Gave thanks. He gave thanks. He took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and said, this is my body, it's for you. Do this as a memorial of me. Did the same with the cup after supper, he said. This cup is the new covenant or new relationship in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this as a memorial for me. Paul wrote those words before Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John were ever written. This is the earliest account of the Lord's Supper and the Last Supper that we have. And it's from Paul. One of the rare times that Paul ever quotes Jesus. And Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, or as a memorial of me. Our words in English don't even come close to what the original language meaning was. Because we have that sense of remember something as, as looking back in time and saying, that happened in 1865, you know, or whatever. Their word, memory and remember, their word meant to take something in the past and bring it into the future, bring it into the now. They were taking the Last Supper and bringing it up to their moment in time. That's what it meant to remember. Jesus gave us a way to connect with him. Same is true for baptism. But at baptism, we do it once because we're experiencing the saving grace of Jesus. The Lord's Supper we do regularly because in it we're experiencing the sustaining grace of Jesus. And Jesus gave us these two ways to connect with him that only require the simplest of things, water, bread, some kind of wine or juice. Things that exist in almost every corner of the world in every culture. Simplest of stuff to find. Before we take the bread and the cup today, I want you to think about one more thing. This table and these emblems do not give us simply an example of one man's sacrificial love. Much more than that. And Jesus didn't leave with us a set of principles that we recite and we follow and we apply and everything will be all right. He didn't do that. And he didn't provide us with some kind of encyclopedic knowledge about God and evil and how the universe works. He didn't do that. We have lots of questions unanswered. And what Jesus gave us, what Jesus gave us is himself. He said, this is my body for you. This is my blood. This is my life given for you. He was giving a way, making a way for us to experience him in a way that we cannot, a tangible, tasteful way of experiencing his sustaining grace to experience him. He entrusted himself to us. That's love. He entrusted himself to us. And the church is the one and only place in the world where this new creation of Christ 
of God is on display and can be seen and experienced. That's us. That's why church matters. That's why church really matters. Let's pray. Father, we, we bow before you because you are just so awesome. It's hard for us to imagine that you would entrust so much to us and give us such great responsibility. Forgive us of all of our fights and all of our differences of opinions. Forgive us for the ways that we rush in trying to fix things, make things right, better. Forgive us for the ways that sometimes we do church and we make a mess of it. But for Father, may you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let us see and understand and know the fullness of this responsibility to display your glory to the watching world, to live these interdependent, mutually equal lives in Christ and to flourish, Father. May our words, may our actions line up with Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you repeat with me our affirmation of faith? I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my personal Lord and Savior. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message today and the sacrifice of your Son and just the gift of salvation and just help us to be more like you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. When Jesus was with his disciples, he took the bread and broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body. Then he took the cup and said, This is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins.